Love of God. I love that song. Well, would you turn with me in your Bible? I have a hard time not saying hymnal. Turn with me in your Bible, please, to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. And when you find that, if you would stand with me. We're going to be reading verse 5, 6, and 7. Verses 5, 6, and 7 of Genesis chapter 6. We'll read this responsively. We uh, will all beginning on verse 5. I'll read verse 6 and then we'll conclude together on verse 7. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you would give us a word from you this morning. Pray that as we open your word here, pray that it would just uh, come powerfully. And we know that your word will not return void. Pray that you would bless the reading of your word. Pray that you would prepare our hearts now to receive the message from you with a special. I thank you so much for bringing us together here. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Filled with sorrow and care, hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. Your worry and fear Burdens are lifted at Calvary Jesus is very near Troubled soul, the Savior can see Every heartache and tear Jesus is very near. All right. <clears throat> well, if you need a title for the message this morning, I guess the title would be, When God Said, I'm Sorry. When God Said, I'm Sorry. And I uh, need to make a few things very clear before you start thinking that I'm going to start preaching heresy. Um, I believe with my whole heart that uh, God is not in the business of changing. He uh, says very clear in Malachi, 
uh, 3 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Um, so he, he doesn't, he's not in the business of changing. He's, uh, there's nothing that surprises God. All right? Um, Psalm 147 5, we see, Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. There's nothing that catches God uh, by surprise. He, he doesn't look at this chapter in Genesis and he doesn't look at the people there and say, Oh man, I didn't realize they were going to do that. He, he's, he's never surprised. God's understanding is infinite. All right, And then, um, no one else can say that. Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like God. Me. There's no one else that we can say is in, infinitely uh, has the infinite wisdom. There's no one else that we can say uh, doesn't change. I, I'd say if we uh, went around the room, we would be able to say that we uh, change uh, our minds often. But that's not what uh, we're talking about here in this chapter. When, when uh, God says in two places, that it repent of the Lord that He hath made man on the earth. And at the end of verse 7, for it repenteth me that I have made them. This, uh, this, is, this is what he's saying, I believe. I uh, have four children, as you, as you well know. And I love my four children. They're wonderful children. But believe it or not, they're not perfect. You're not supposed to laugh. You're supposed to gasp. Uh, but they, they aren't. They're, they're not perfect, and primarily because they have an imperfect uh, father. But uh, they, they do things that may not uh, be obedient. And so on occasion, just ever so rare occasion, they may get in trouble. And uh, if there's an issue of uh, direct disobedience, then their father may say, all right, so-and-so, and I'm not going to embarrass them to tell them which one is most recent. And I uh, said, go to my room. You uh, have uh, done wrong. You have directly disobeyed me. And so there's a consequence for that direct disobedience. And so... Um, they go to my room, and I uh, follow shortly, and I would administer a, a spanking. And uh, may I say that that is a uh, very proper and uh, okay thing to do. Uh, not in anger, not in frustration, but there's not a thing wrong with... Uh, giving a, a good spanking. And uh, for my children uh, and how we, we operate as a family, um, and this has been since they were little, uh, we're very, very consistent. But when I give a spanking, it's one swat. It's one good swat. It's one swat. And it's very effective. But it, they, they know that daddy means business. All right? It's not a massive... Uh, bout of frustration and let me, you know. But you know what happens when I give them a spanking? We pray. We say, uh, uh, explain what happens. And I say, I'm sorry that this had to be this way. I'm sorry that I had to give you a spanking. I'm sorry that I had to discipline you. I'm sorry that you did wrong. Did I, am I saying that, man, I wish I never would have given you that spanking? No. Am I saying that I wish that uh, you were never born? No. But I'm saying it grieves me. It hurts me. And I believe if you're, uh, you're effectively disciplining your children, it will grieve you. It will hurt you when you have to discipline them. But that's what God's saying here. He says, It repented 
the Lord that He had made man on the earth. And it grieved Him at His heart. At the very core, man, it grieved Him. This is when God said, I'm sorry. And actually, there's, a, there's another uh, place too, but we don't have time to go to both of them. So we're going to stick to this one tonight, or this morning. Get your time. Used to preaching at night and not in the morning. Uh, but uh, this, is, this, is the, uh, this is the first place where the uh, Lord says, I'm sorry. Why, why is it and when is it that uh, God said, I'm sorry? He's, he was uh, sorry when he saw, first of all, great wickedness. Verse 5, the beginning of verse 5, he says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great. He, uh, if we look in uh, Luke chapter 17, Luke chapter 17, verse 26, says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And so then he goes on to describe what it's like in the uh, days of the Son of Man. And if we can go to uh, 2 Timothy 3 and I think give us a little better description. If you go there, 2 Timothy 3, we're looking to say, okay, what was it like? It, it was, it, was it really that bad that God said, yeah, I'm sorry, it grieves my heart. What does this mean? If we go to 2 Timothy verse uh, 3, verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We're, we're talking about those same last days that in Luke it reflected back as in the days of Noah, right? So I think we can safely say that as what we're getting ready to read is very similar to as in the days of Noah, okay? And we're going to see what this great wickedness was like says in chapter 3, verse 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. How about that next one? Unthankful. Unholy. Uh, this, this list is a pretty big deal to God. He put it in the Bible, right? He, and he, he said, in the last days, these things are uh, come about. And, and, and Luke, he said, these, these, in these last days, it's just going to be like in the days of Noah. And so I, I'm, I've got to believe that these things are just like in the days of Noah. Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affection. Truce breakers. Not keeping your word. False accusers. Incontinent. Fierce. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady. High-minded. Think more of yourself than you ought. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. It's quite a list, isn't it? This is, this is what God's saying. You know what? I am I'm sorry. I have a grieving heart because I'm seeing that great wickedness. Not only is it a great wickedness that he sees, but if we look on, it says, and um, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart. He saw grave thoughts. Yeah, so he saw great wickedness, but he also saw grave thoughts. Our thoughts are important, you know that? What goes through our mind is important. What we dwell on is vastly important. In uh, Proverbs 15, 26, the beginning of it says, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination 
to the Lord. What kind of thoughts are we talking about? What, what, is those, what are those thoughts of the wicked? I'd say those are thoughts of anger. Those are thoughts of hatred. Thoughts of lust. Thoughts of covetousness. This is some of what we saw back in Timothy, isn't it? Thoughts of self-pity. Thoughts of worthlessness. These are not thoughts of God. Thoughts of self-degradation. Thoughts of self-harm. Thoughts of anxiety. Thoughts of fear. Thoughts of inferiority. These thoughts of the wicked, they're, they're an abomination unto God. And when, when God says, I'm sorry when I see these things. It grieves my heart, these th- evil thoughts. We need to take a look and say, what, what is it? What evil thoughts do we have? What is it that we can just continually think about, continually uh, if you would meditate on, not the good meditation either, what is it that just keeps on flooding my thoughts? What, what should we, doing, we be doing with those thoughts? We're supposed to be renewing our mind, right? How do we renew our mind? We renew our mind by the Word, right? If we renew our mind, then those thoughts are going to change. And when those thoughts begin to change, our actions begin to th- change. Because we know that as a man thinketh in his heart... So is he. And out of the heart is where everything happens. That, that deep-seated, innermost being. He saw great wickedness. He saw grave thoughts. And then, at the end of this, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He saw persistent evil. Persistent evil. What happens when we continually sin? Man, it grieves God. It grieves God. You know what else happens when we continually sin? When we we, uh, just keep doing what we know we shouldn't be doing, but we do it anyway? It breaks down that communication barrier between us and God. That's that's devastating from a Christian's point of view. Because who are we if we can't talk to our Heavenly Father? If we can't communicate to our Heavenly Father? If we can't have that open line of communication with our Heavenly Father? When we, when, if as a, as a son who, who loves my dad and just adores my dad and thinks the world of my dad, man, if there's something that is, I know I've done against him or something that he, he doesn't love or doesn't like that I've done, and I, I, I don't have that communication the same with him, man, it's devastating to me as a child. That's why we keep short accounts, and that's why we... we that's why, as, as a father, that's why when my children uh, disobey, we take care of it. And then those things that they've done, the, the disobedience, that's taken care of. There's, there's now a fresh communication, clear communication. And everything they've done, in our family we have what we call a no fishing pond. When they've, when they've uh, uh, been forgiven, that stuff goes in the no fishing pond. Same way with this, our, our Tanya and I, our, our spouse. When you've asked for forgiveness and that forgiveness has been granted, that goes in the no fishing pond. And you can't go back over there again and get it. God, want, God wants an open communication. When we, when we don't have any, nothing between my soul and the Savior, right? That's what God wants from us. When we have that continually sinning and we say, you know what, I... I, I doesn't uh, it, it's it, it's I'm I'm hardening my heart and I I it, I'm just going to continue to sin and continue to do it and continue to do it and that that's 
cutting off that communication with God. Are you still a Christian? You're still God's child. If it doesn't bug you and doesn't bother you, you might want to uh, take a serious hard look at that. But just because you, you sin doesn't mean you're not a child of God. It means you don't have that relationship. You don't have that communication like you once had. All right. He saw great wickedness. He saw grave thoughts. He saw persistent evil. You thought those three points was it, didn't you? It's not. The question is then, is this you? If this is you and God's is saying, I'm sorry, it grieves my heart. But let's look at that next verse. Go to Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. There's a but in there. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. What is that grace? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That grace we've been uh, taught is God's sufficiency for my insufficiency, right? So God, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Whether Noah deserved it or not. God's sufficiency picked up the slack where Noah couldn't uh, uh, meet, where Noah couldn't live up to. All right, he 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 gave grace. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a just man. This is this is what we need to be looking at. If we say, God, I'm, I don't want you to say I'm sorry about me. God, I don't want you to. Be able to say, you're grieved in your heart by looking at me. Then we need to look at Noah. Because Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah was a just man is what it says, right? A just man. In, uh, in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary, that word just is uh, referred to as righteous. One with a holy heart. Holy in heart. Observant of divine commands as a righteous man. Noah, he, he wanted to do what was right. He had that desire to do what was right. He was not only a just man, but he was perfect in his generations. What's that mean? That perfect, that, that's, uh, that means to be uh, upright, fearing God. It's kind of like Job. We can go to Job chapter 1. It's, it's, it's pretty much uh, outlined what's that just man. Job chapter 1 verse 1, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect. Does that mean he was sinless? He never did anything wrong? No. He was perfect and upright. One that feared God and eschewed evil. What's that mean? That's what that word eschewed is he shunned evil. He, he, he avoided evil. He was one that said, I, I'm not going to do that when it comes to him. He's one that's uh, what doesn't allow temptation and opportunity in the same room together. He eschewed evil. He was one that uh, was not willing to uh, compromise. He was, he was one that uh, he, he feared God. What's that, what's that mean to fear God? That, that word feared God, sometimes we just think of it as an irreverential awe. But it's a lot bigger than that, I believe. I believe with my whole heart that fear God, if we were to put a definition on it, it would be something like this. I recognize that I serve a holy, an almighty, a just God. And that holy, almighty, just God sees me in everything that I do, everything that I say, everything that I think, and everything that I do, say, and think is seen by God and one day will be judged by God. 
if we live our lives with that fear of God, not just this, oh, but really, fear God, recognizing that everything I do, everything I say, everything that I think is seen by God. And one day we'll be judged by God. That's fear. If, if my kids, they, I think, believe sometimes that I have eyes in the back of my head still. And they recognize that everything they see, everything they do, and I think they may even think everything they think is known by their father. That is a large portion of why they do right. Because they fear dad. And they know that dad will find out and will be judged by dad. If we can turn that around and say, we have a God who is omnipotent, is omniscient, is omnipresent, is, is everything. He can see. He doesn't need eyes in the back of his head. And he, can't even read, he can even read my mind. He knows my thoughts. Nobody else can do that. God knows my thoughts. And even what I think is known by God and one day will be judged by God. This is a pretty big deal. Job, he was that perfect and upright, one that feared God and one that eschewed evil. This, this word perfect, if we go back to Genesis and see Noah as, as this perfect man, he was one that is uh, not defective. He was complete. God wants us to be perfect, I believe. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 9 to 11 says, For we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. Therefore I write these things, be absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord had given uh, me to edification and not to destruction. Finally, my brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. He's telling us, Paul writing to the church of Corinth, and I believe he's writing to us as well, be perfect. God, God, God expects that uh, completeness. Not only are we to be perfect, but our love is to be perfect. First John four sixteen and 17 we can look at that, and he says, And we have known and believed that the love that God hath to us, God is love. He that dwelleth in God, in God in Him. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. What is that perfect love? I, I think that perfect love is, would be that agape love. That's that love that God gives us. That's that love with shoes on. That's that, uh, I saw somewhere else, love with work gloves on. Being willing to not only know a need and uh, see a need, but uh, able to and willing to Put yourself out there for that need, knowing that you're not going to receive anything back. You're not going to get anything back for it. I think that's what that perfect love is. Our love is to be perfect, and then our patience is to be perfect. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I love the book of James. James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptation, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that it may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. God wants us to have that perfect patience. This is a tough one, but... When we have that perfect patience, it's complete. God's saying, you, you need to strive 
for that um, that perfect patience. And I, I don't know of anybody here, really, probably that has that, except for maybe Tanya. But the that perfect patience, because that uh, that that is what it takes to. <laughs> we were talking about in Sunday school, and I know Brother Bill uh, preached about this in the uh, prison uh, Saturday morning. But that's that's what it takes to have that. That meekness, that fruit of the spirits, that ability to negotiate among others without causing friction, that that patience. We are to have our patience to be perfect, our love to be perfect. And then if we stay in James chapter three, James is a tough book because he hits where the rubber meets the road. Verse two. For in many things we offend all. If any man offends not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Our tongue should be perfect. This is, again, we go back to that meekness, right? That ability to negotiate among others without causing friction. That's that's something that is the fruit of the Spirit, right? And if it's a fruit of the Spirit, that means it's not a fruit of me. It's not something that I can do on my own. So perfection is not going to happen just by me wanting it to happen. I'm not going to be that perfect man, that that just and perfect man, just by working harder and trying harder and wanting to uh, do better. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to... I, I'm, it's settled. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to change. I'm going... As long as we're saying I, 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 that's me doing it. That's not grace. Because grace is His sufficiency for my insufficiency. And I know I'm insufficient. I know I am helpless. I know that I can't do it on my own. But I serve a God who can. His sufficiency for my insufficiency. And then let's look at, uh, go back to Genesis chapter Six. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Number one, Noah walked. Those of you who are... Uh, uh, come to RU, you know the definition of walking. If you don't uh, come to RU, definition of walking is very much the same. Taking repeated steps in the same direction, right? Take, taking that walking, repeated steps, right? This is repeated steps. If, if you're just standing with God, your theme song can be, I shall not be moved. Because that's just standing. Well, what the Bible said is uh, he, he, he walked with God. That means when God moves with him and directs him, he walks. He takes repeated steps in that direction. He doesn't stand still. He's not just in one, one place all the time. If you're staying in one place as a Christian, you're not walking with God. You're, you're, you had a, had a, a, a time with God. But that's not walking. Walking is repeated steps in the same direction, right? With God. And then, uh, not only is it walking, but it's walking with. Right? It's not, God, back there. I- I'm glad you're back there. And you, you just go on that way, and I'll, I'll, just, I'll meet you somewhere up here. It's God, right? Right with me. Had a friend uh, that I was in Russia with, and uh, this is... Way too many years ago, uh, twenty some years ago, and uh, I, I've always been a fast walker, and I was even a faster walker then than I am now. And he he informed me that a a friend who I was walking with uh, was not in front of, not behind, but actually was next to walking with. And I think that's very important when we l- we look at he walked with God. Don't get ahead of God. Don't be f- Lagging behind, but you're walking with God. So not only is he walking, 
Not only does he walk with, but he walks with God. Not walking with his old friends, not walking with his old companionships or old old habits, but walking with God. It's, it's kind of like that uh, yoking up with God that uh, I've talked about. And if, if are you going to cause, if you are a Christian, you have Christ living in me. Oh, what a salvation this that Christ liveth in me. And if we're going to do that, are we going to cause Jesus to look at those things and have Him in the same room while I'm looking at those things? Or are we going to cause Him to uh, be with me as I explode in anger? Or maybe be with me as I have inappropriate conversations with other people? He walked with God. Man, it's important. We're walking with God. Not just our own, what, what we want. Our company matters. Our company matters. Now you may say, you know what, Brother Bob, I'm not seeing myself as this just God, this just guy, this perfect guy, this guy that walks with God. It seems to me that I'm more like the folks that God is saying I'm sorry about. And it's a sad thing if God is saying I'm sorry to you. But there's something we can do about that. And I think a good outline of what we can do about that comes on the heels of when... David made some serious mistakes in his life. He messed up. He was up on a rooftop when he shouldn't be. She was up on a rooftop probably when she shouldn't be. And he was tempted. He allowed temptation and opportunity in the same roof together. But don't do that. We know that we're, we're human. As soon as he went up to that rooftop, and saw somebody out there. He should have turned right back around and went right down. But instead, he allowed that temptation and opportunity in the same room together. And committed adultery. Tried to cover his sins. We know the story. Had her husband killed. But God got a hold of his heart. And I pray that tonight, or this morning... If you're that person that God is saying, I'm sorry about, God will get a hold of your heart. And he, he says, number one, he recognizes his sin in Psalm chapter 51. I think this is a psalm that we should have memorized. Because this is a psalm that we can just pray right to God. Many, many times I've use this psalm to, to change that communication that I have with God, to open it up. Number one, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to the love and kindness, according to the, mercy, according to the multitude of thy tender mercy, blot out my transgression. He recognized his sin. He admitted that he sinned. Wash me throughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. You know, you're not going to have that washing and cleansing if we don't recognize our sin. If we don't acknowledge that we've sinned against God. And recognize that against Thee and Thee only have I sinned and done this evil in Thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He recognized, you know what? This is something that I was born with. This thing called a sin nature. Got it from my parents. Got it from Adam and Eve. It's not something that I can 
uh, run away from, but behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And then he's saying, God, cleanse me. This next one. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. This is a guy who is a murderer and adulterer. Surely, if he can say, wash me, I can be whiter than snow. There's not a single person in this room that can't have the cleansing power of Jesus Christ on his heart. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Are you broken this morning? Make me to hear joy and gladness. This guy was at the, at the end of himself. He was, he was at the bottom. And yet he can say, God, I'm not there yet, but make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. And blot out all mine iniquities. And this is a good one to remember. This is verse number 10. God, create in me a clean heart, O God. This, is, you, this word create, that's a powerful word. This isn't something that is just mold. Mold it back to being where you want it. Create. Create. Isn't that making something out of nothing? Create in me. I, I've... I've messed up royally. God, it's going to take you to change my, my heart from a messed up heart to a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. That right spirit, our spirit, we're, we're talking, to, talking about a, 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 a child of the king, one who had an alive spirit. And to say, renew a right spirit within me. When we're a Christian, when we're saved, that spirit of ours is alive and it communicates with God's spirit. Though we are a child of God, right? He says, renew that right spirit within me. He says, please God, cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Not, give me my happiness back. That's not what he says. Restore unto me the joy of whose salvation? Thy salvation. It's not my salvation. It's thy salvation. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. And you know what? This is just the greatest part. He, re- he restores his joy. He creates in us a clean heart. He washes me thoroughly from my iniquities and he cleanses me from my sin. And then he said, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto me, unto thee. When we get ourselves right and we let God do the cleansing, we get, let God do the fixing, then that turns our mess into an amazing testimony. And we can go on this way and say, God, I may have messed up, but now, am I going to teach transgressors thy way and sinners will be converted unto thee? Is what David did a good thing? No. You sin against an almighty God? Absolutely. But no matter how bad we fail, no matter how much we mess up, God can still use it for good. Because then, will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Because because they've seen the change in my heart. They've seen what God can do in my heart. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, thou God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing loud aloud of thy righteousness. God, you cleanse me. You you give me a good relationship here. And I'll praise you. And I'll sing of your righteousness. And then he says, O Lord, open thou my lips. My mouth shall show forth 
to Thy praise. He keeps saying, man, you did good stuff for me, God. For Thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings, the sacrifices of God. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. What's God want from us? He's not wanting the, the lamb and the... You know, he's not wanting just the, the, that stuff. He's wanting our hearts. He's wanting that contrite spirit, that broken spirit and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure and desire and build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased. I'd say we started in the beginning of this psalm uh, with a God who was not very happy. He wasn't very pleased. In fact, he was probably saying, I'm sorry. But at the end, he says, Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shalt thou offer bullocks upon thine altar. When we get ourselves and our hearts right with God and let God do the cleansing, then he's ready to let us serve him. Then he's ready for us to say, I, I, I give you my all, God. Anything you want me to do, anywhere you want me to go, any, it, it, it's all yours. Wonder tonight. Is God saying, I'm sorry? Is God saying I'm sorry to uh, any of us that we have something in our heart that's just con evil continually, a uh, um, great wickedness, grave thoughts for that persistent e evil? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that as We contemplate what you have for us this morning. Pray that we would be sincere in doing business with you. God, I pray that as we come into this invitation time, that we would not let pride get in the way. But we would make holy decisions for you, desiring that clear communication with you, our Father. I thank you for your word, Lord. And I pray that it has made a difference in our hearts this morning.